Hello and welcome back to part two of today's webinar series. I want to remind you to please post your questions on the platform during the presentation and we will address these after Tony is done. Our next session will focus on delivering business solutions for work and asset management. This will be presented by Vitasi's Projects and Innovation Director, Tony Turner. Tony is a qualified civil engineer and Maximo certified consultant. His experience includes seven years in construction management, 28 years of Maximo in utilities, oil and gas, rail, and the defense industry. Tony has also led some of the largest and most successful Maximo implementation projects worldwide. Over to you, Tony, to give us all the details. Thank you, Gavin. Hi, I'm Tony. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about linear asset management in a utility. And basically, we're going to look at the linear asset management functionality. We're going to start off with a background about what the traditional approaches have done in the past, look at some of the challenges that that produces, then show how the linear solution can address that. And then we're going to have a bit of a comparison about whether you go linear, GIS, or both. And finally, we'll wrap up with a conclusion. So if we look at water industry, the traditional approach has been a typical Maxima hierarchy. It's very good for water treatment plants and sewage treatment plants. It's very good for pump stations and basically you're above ground assets. So if you take a water treatment plant, it's broken up into possibly the raw water, the filtration, the clarification and the treated reservoir storage. So the hierarchy approach works pretty well. However, when we look at a utility and a distribution utility, not everything is the water treatment plants. Um, you've got the underground assets, the pipelines, the valves. Um, these are a challenge. And then the other challenge is that they're spatial. So they're not just in one place. They're spread all over the county or the country, depending on how big the utility is. And the response has typically been people back off from the problem and they say, let GIS own the underground assets. And that's great because the GIS can map them. It shows them very graphically on a map and people can see. The downside is it doesn't hold an asset model and there is no asset history held within Maximo. So when you want to go and see the age of the pi pipeline, the performance of the pipeline, you can't see it. So that's a typical water industry challenge. Same thing on electricity. If we look at electricity, um, Again, we typically use the hierarchy approach for power stations, and it works extremely well. I mean, I've been doing power stations in Maxima for 30 years. Uh, it models very nicely, and with structured numbering systems like KKS, it's actually a very convenient way of doing it. It also works for substations, because substations, again, are point assets, and there's physically, identical, uh, physically identified pieces of equipment, things like transformers, circuit breakers, isolator switches. Again, the hierarchy works very well for the power stations. It works well for the plant, uh, but we also have a distributed network. So the hierarchy approach, it doesn't show you the end-to-end -end connectivity. So when a customer doesn't have power, it's not possible for the operator to trace it back that that power comes from this overhead line, from that circuit breaker, from that switch, back to that substation. Um, so that people want to see the connectivity. They want to be able to model overhead lines and underground cables. And they also need the plant and the linear assets, sorry, the linear assets and the plant assets contained in a single model. So effectively you can strap through the process to go from the transformer to the bus bar, to the circuit breaker, to the feeder, to the overhead line. And like water, we have the same challenge, they're spatial. So the network assets are spread around the whole country or the you know, large geographical area. Um, and that needs to be taken into account when you're actually scheduling work. So shortfalls, no end-to-end connectivity. How do you model the overhead lines? How do you model the underground cables? You haven't got a single asset model. And what happens when the network changes? Sometimes the changes are we're going to put another circuit in and change the routing. It could even be somebody operates a switch in the control center and the whole network connectivity model can change. We need something which can adopt, adapt rapidly to that scenario. So the challenges. And 
most utilities will admit they've got multiple source systems. All of these source systems have a partial view of the assets in the network. For example, in electricity, you've got a network control system. Um, that's quite a big, uh, very technology-based solution. It's got control Swiss, uh, systems, it's got switches, electronic, but very often it doesn't contain the bulk of the assets, which are low voltage assets. It also doesn't represent other parts of the network, such as the buildings for the substations, the fences, the poles, and the transmission towers. So network control systems got a lot, but not everything. GIS is similar. GIS is very good for the linear assets and it will have the poles and it will have the towers. But what it doesn't do typically is it doesn't show the internals within the substation. You don't see the plant, the actual breakers themselves, the transformers, the bus bars. And with the experience with clients, very often it doesn't show the connections at the houses or the end customer. Other utilities rely on CRM systems, which holds information about the customer, their address, the meters at the house. And increasingly in the UK, we now have asset decision support tools, tools like CBRM, computer-based risk management from EA Technologies, Copperleaf, um, Seams. There are a number of these tools around. The regulator is insisting that the utilities use them basically to report the condition, the health of their assets and the risk associated with those assets. Again, there's a shortfall. They don't cover all the asset types. They don't have spatial references. There's no connectivity between those assets. And very often those systems need more data than is available from a single source system. So we end up with lots of spreadsheets and feeder systems going to the ADST tools. Um, electric utilities have the problems of vegetation management and tree cutting. Again, they may have a separate database or a separate system just to do that. Most utilities tend to do capacity modeling. And very often you'll find it's on a different system or a different GIS from the one that they use operationally. And finally, they fall back to the traditional fallback, multiple spreadsheets. Real life example here, one utility we worked at recently identified th more than 300 tactical spreadsheets in use at that utility. So what's the bright idea? We need a single source of the truth. And we believe that Maximo can be that single source of the truth. It doesn't eliminate the other systems. It works in conjunction with them and adds to them. So how do we actually achieve that within Maximo? And the solution here is linear asset management. With linear asset management, you can create an entire network model, including the plant and the linear assets. Use the Maximo linear functionality for things like pipelines and underground cables and overhead lines. Use normal maximum assets for pumps, valves, transformers, circuit breakers, bus bars, etc. And then we can use the maximum location functionality for non asset type uh, objects such as buildings, culverts, um, substation civils. So, maximum linear network management is also added to this. So, it's not just linear assets we're talking about, it's actually linear work. Now, a linear work order could be an inspection. You're actually walking a circuit and as you progress against it linearly, you're recording observations at measurement points. Tree cutting, so, or tree management, or laying new pipes. All of these are linear work types. And added functionality we can bring into the picture here, we can use things like the dynamic job plans. So if you've got a walking inspection and the guy walks at one mile an hour, you can actually use a dynamic job plan to take in to estimate how long it would take that resource to actually occupy um, the entire inspection of the circuit. Or we could use dynamic job plans for measuring how much cables required and time to lay underground cables. So, some examples here. Um, in the linear asset approach, we basically maintain assets in sections of the circuit or the sections of the, the network. Um, as the asset changes, we need to update the system. Now your traditional EAM approach um, can require creating all new assets and you, sorry, using the traditional approach to the hierarchies, what happens is somebody changes a, a pipeline, they create new assets. And what happens here is they lose the history of the old asset. For example, you've got a pipeline underground and as a leak, we need to replace a section of the pipe. 
in the old world, we'd have to create, split the existing asset into two. So there's up to the break and after the break, and then a section in the middle for the new bit of pipe that we just put in. So you end up with three assets where you originally had one, and you've just lost the history for that for those assets. Um, with linear, we keep the asset, we keep, maintain the asset where it is, and we then use linear specifications to resolve this problem. So the attribute changes from being a cast iron pipe to a PTFE pipe to a cast iron pipe. We don't lose any data, we don't lose any history. Another example is relationships. So we've got a circuit going from A to B. Um, the circuit's got 100 poles in it. And at pole number 33, we decide that they want to do a spur to a house. And here, we've maintained the original asset. We put in the new spur in blue. And we've then got a relationship that the new spur connects to the original asset um, at that pole number 35. So what, what are the concepts here? First of all, we allow the users to identify assets as being linear. And doing that, we can then virtually segment the linear assets without um, affecting the underlying ge geometry. Sorry, that's a tongue twister. Um, so we've got one asset, but that asset may change. It's going from rural area to city area. It's going from 100 millimeter squared bare cable to 180 millimeters squared insulated cable. Every time the asset attribute changes, we have linear attributes that can change without affecting the asset. And having got this model set up, we can then use concepts such as um, features. So features are identifying points used for referencing, linear attributes, and relationships between the assets. This approach also supports linear work orders, such as circuit inspections or vegetation clearance. I'll give you a couple of examples in the next slide. So before we do that, this is what Maximo looks like for linear. So we've got the asset, we've defined it as linear. I go to the specifications tab, which you're all familiar with, and the specifications, as you can see, are linear specifications. So the first two specs I've got here are the type of area. So what is demographic area, is it? So this particular line goes from a rural area to an urban area. And you can see that the first from zero to 1.2 kilometers, it's in the urban area. And from 1.2 to the end of the line, it's in a rural area. So we've got the attribute changing over distance. Similarly, the cable could change or the um, pole, uh, what type it is, is an overhead line, is an underground cable. Um, all of those are linear attributes and we can change them without changing the asset itself. And here is the representation you would see on your screen. Within that, you've got this nice scale, scale bar, which shows you the entire extent of the asset. You can zoom in into particular sections and you can see how the attributes change over distance, um, such as the type of area it's going through. You can also see on the same screen, any work orders against it, any re relationships such as the poles that carry it. And also when you're doing a work order, you can actually see progress on the work order. So here I've got an example, I've got an inspection of the entire circuit. On the first day, we did the first bit and in blue, the second day, we did the next bit. So you can see how the linear work progresses against the entire work order. And this also allows you to jump to say, I'm doing the first two kilometers today and the last two kilometers. And then tomorrow I'm coming in, coming back, and I'm starting the inspection from change two. Um, again, real world situations. Very often in the electric utility, you might have two people carrying out an inspection. And the way they do it, they drive, both drive together in the van. The first guy drops off at the start of the circuit and starts walking, doing his inspection. The next guy then drives halfway along the circuit, parks the van, hides the key in the wheel arch, and there's a secret for you and keeps walking. And then they all meet up at the pub at the end of the circuit and they've done the whole inspection. So that's the um, linear view and the specifications. We then have the relationships. So on the relationships, we can then say, how do these assets interact with each other? So here I've got a 33 kV circuit from going from Port Floyd to Methlick in Scotland. And I then identified the poles. Now the poles are not electrically connected to the circuit, at least we hope they're not. Um, but what the pole does is it carries the circuit. So here we're now identifying the pole. It's a key asset because if the pole breaks, the circuit breaks and we lose 
um, customers. Um, so we're identifying the pole and the attributes, which are not electrical uh, assets, but they are important to the network. And then we've got the connection. So this particular circuit, I've got the feeder breaker coming in and I've got the breaker, the, the isolator at the other end. And then I could step through the network and move from asset to asset and step my way through the connectivity model. So some examples here. We're doing overhead lines. We've got damage. The inspectors reported damage. The damage is actually on the circuit B35. Okay, we know which circuit it is. And it's on pole number 35 slash 121, sorry. Can't see that. So the damage is on 30 pole reference to pole number 35, 121. And the instruction is to replace the insulation, but it's only the first 12 meters. So the linear reference here for the work order is from naught meters, that's at the pole, to 12 meters from the pole, we want to put insulation. Whatever reason, in this particular example, maybe the pole or the rest of the cable is not insulated. Another example, tree encroachment. I've got a tree encroaching on circuit B35. Where is the tree? It's actually 35 meters from pole 35 slash six, and it's two meters north of the line. Now, in the old days, how do people do this? They try and get GPS coordinates. Well, GPS coordinates are pretty good, except is it that tree or this tree? By using this linear referencing, the guy can get to the pole, he knows where the pole is, he measures out 35 meters, and he measures two meters. He's got the exact tree which needs cutting. On a linear work order for line inspections, we're doing a work order on circuit B35, starting at change 2.3, finishing the work order, change 6.7 and we can measure progress that we do each day. So this is some examples of how we would use linear work orders in reality. Next question, linear or GIS? And very often in the past, people have said, I'd like to use Maximo Linear, but I've got a GIS system, can't use both. Or very much in the case of water companies, we often hear, Ah, oh, but GIS is the owner of the assets. It owns all of the asset information. We don't need assets in Maximo. We think the solution here is to use both. Use both linear and GIS. So the GIS view shows the linear assets in a spatial view. So you look at the map, you can see the linear assets very clearly, very well. And you have the linear attributes that I discussed earlier, the ones like, is it going through a rural area or an urban area? What type of cable is it? All those linear attributes could be held as layers on the GIS. We can then use the GIS for what it's good for, spatial queries, to select assets, to view the network, to view the connectivity, even to view work orders. And you can use tools like polygons, so you can draw a boundary around a particular area of network you're interested in and retrieve the assets or work orders that fall within that polygon. Or we could do a different way. We could say, pick on this point and show me all work within a radius of two kilometers. And so by using those spatial queries, we can return the work orders or the assets or put the work orders into a package that we can then give to the um, technical team. The linear model in Maximo, it holds the linear attributes. And again, it also shows you within the linear screen, the GIS map view. So you can actually see both systems together. And linear assets and work orders feed the linear volume information to the regulator. Again, this is a UK specific, but we see it coming into other regulators around the world and also other, other industries. So the regulators in the UK insist on knowing how many kilometers of overhead line have you erected, how many kilometers have you refurbished, how many kilometers of overhead line you inspected. Um, similarly, how many poles have you replaced? All of that information is required by the regulator. The Ofgem has them, what I call the mother of all spreadsheets, with 132 tabs, each tab has got about 100 columns. It is huge, and 100 lines. And basically, they want to know everything, not only what you've done, but why you did it. Was it for network reinforcement? Was it for faults? Um, you know, what was the reason for doing the work? And the other thing is, we can start using dynamic job plans so we can scale up linear work um, according to the, the length of cable or length of circuit that you're actually putting in. So here's a view that was the, at the bottom there, you see the linear specification view, which I showed you before. And as you can see now, we've got a map view superimposed on top of that, showing you the, um, 
showing you the uh, linear view. The linear in GIS is pre-configured. There are no extra steps required in ArcGIS to have linear. It's just a layer and you identify the attributes as linear. So easy to put in. Now, wrapping up here, lessons learned. First of all, use Maximo to build the whole asset model. So you've got your point assets, you've got your linear assets, you've got the connection between them. So circuit breaker 12 connects to circuit B35. Use the relationships between the point and the linear assets to show that connectivity. So the isolated, so you can follow the chain from the isolator to the transformer, the bus bar, to the circuit breaker, to the circuit, to the individual pole, to the pole mounted transformer on the pole. Same thing in water, the pump goes to the valve, goes to the pipeline, goes to another valve, goes to a meter. We follow that train through. Use both for the best outcome is using GIS and linear or maximum spatial and linear together. Use the asset hierarchy where it's appropriate. So a linear asset has, can also have a hierarchy so you could split the circuit into sections within the sections you've got um, spurs. Um, they're all linear assets, but you can actually have a hierarchy of them. We suggest you don't try and put your poles and towers into your location hierarchy, which you probably did traditionally. This falls down when you get situations that um, a tower carries more than one circuit. Um, in a hierarchy, you can't have more than one parent. Whereas if we use the carrier relationship, we can model that. And use the limerear referencing from features to another asset. So um, instead of going from the circuit breaker and pacing out 1.2 kilometers, it's quite simple. You go to pole number 35 and you pace out three meters. Conclusion, use Maximo to build the whole asset model. Use traditional Maximo for point assets. And use Maximo linear to represent your linear assets such as overhead lines, underground cables, pipelines. Use locations for civils where there may no be, not be an asset for things like fences, buildings, culverts. Use the relationship to link all of the activities for your connectivity, and also relationships to show things like carrying, so the pole carries or the building contains. And use GIS together, relation, together with linear for spatial information. So basically, Maxima becomes a single source of the truth for all of the network assets and the work management, for management, regulatory reporting, the health of the assets, lifecycle management. Well, that concludes the presentation. Thank you for listening and uh, over to you, Gavin. Awesome, thank you, Tony. Um, right, in a moment, we're gonna move into a live Q&A session. Uh, I want you to please note that you can remain in the auditorium as this will automatically transition you into the live Q&A. We'll also ask you to please allow for a couple of minutes for everyone to join. But in the meantime, please feel free to post your questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, on the right hand side of your screen.